Good afternoon. Can I get as Thank you for joining us today for this colloquium. My name is Michael Buddy. I'm chair of the Department of Catholic Studies here at DePaul University. I'm also a senior research scholar in the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology. It's great to have you with us today. And thank you for making time. I want to thank also the 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 over overworked and underloved staff people who do all the work around here, Francis Allen, Karen Kraft, Anna. Uh, thank you for their efforts and for making it possible for us to gather today. Uh, before I introduce our speaker today, I wanted to bring to your attention um, an upcoming event next Friday evening, May 29th, it's with a reception at 6. It's a public lecture entitled, Born of Lament, The Gift and Discipline of Hope in Africa, by our friend and colleague, Emmanuel Katangali who is a scholar in residence with the center this term. He also is a uh, faculty member in the Kroc Institute at the University of Notre Dame. So I, I encourage you to come out and uh, join us for what will undoubtedly be a, a, a wonderful conversation for us. Yeah. Um, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure to meet Bill Cavanaugh personally, I encourage you to do so. He's a, he's a first-rate colleague. And a, and a fine, fine friend. Um, he came to us having worked for many years at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota, which means that he may be the only person in the room to move to Chicago for the weather. <laughs> <laughs> he received an undergraduate degree in theology from the University of Notre Dame, uh, did graduate studies at Cambridge University, and completed his PhD in religion at Duke University uh, back when dinosaurs were on the earth. Um, Bill, lots of people can have a large academic CV, having done Bill's annual evaluations for the last three years, he's had to trim his down to make it large, he really makes the rest of us look shabby, it's really not fair. He's authored five books, he's edited two other books, he has published more than 40 peer-reviewed peer journal articles, and more than 40 chapters in edited volumes. He's lectured in well over a dozen countries, continues working as the co-editor of the prestigious journal Modern Theology. His forthcoming book is entitled Field Hospital, and will be published by Eerdmans Press. Um, Bill, Bill also is a uh, rather serious brewer of beer in his spare time, <laughs> which gives him great happiness. <laughs> that his alma mater paid $2 million last year for a football coach not to coach brings him no happiness. <laughs> so that was in the news. So addressing the topic of the fall of the fall of political history is uh, both a timely and a welcome subject. Um, Bill has in many ways redefined much of the conversation in politics and theology surrounding the early modern period. Um, from the uh, end of the Middle Ages into the, the rise of modern states and modern markets. His, uh, his book, The Myth of Religious Violence, has redirected entire scholarly and, and, and popular conversations on what we think we know and what we think we say when we talk about the relationship between religion and violence, particularly his historical and theological work during the period in question overlaps nicely with what he's going to talk about in a different direction with different emphases today. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Bill Cavanaugh. Thanks, Mike. So glad that Don Rickles was not available to do the introduction today. <laughs> got Mike uh, to do it. Um, let me add my voice of thanks to, uh, to my colleagues in the center, Mike and Stan, and to our staff, uh, Karen and, and Francis and Anna. And um, let me add, uh, uh, thank the director of the center, who in his wisdom and uh, keen eye for talent has asked me to do this uh, talk today. <laughs> That's a joke, I'm the director of the center. Uh, and I volunteered myself uh, to do this. This is part of a uh, project um, <clears throat> that I'm, I'm with uh, the Colossian, it's called the Colossian Forum. Um, it's partially funded by the Templeton Foundation. Jack Templeton just died to, today, I saw. Um, the Colossian Forum is um, meant to do 
theology and science kinds of uh, conversations, but do them in a way that takes um, uh, theology seriously, and uh, which is not always the case in these kinds of conversations. And they asked me to uh, co-lead a group with Jamie Smith on um, uh, a project on evolution and the fall. And so most of the, I mean, the first thing I said when they asked me to do this was that I don't know anything about uh, either one of those, and I don't really know the theology and science uh, conversation. Um, but they said, that's okay, uh, we want you to kind of take a political angle on this. And so that's kind of what I've done. Most of the people in the group are either theologians or scientists, um, all of whom have, except me, have kind of worked in the theology science uh, dialogue. But they asked me to kind of do, uh, do something political about this. What are the political ramifications or what are the political causes? Of, um, that, that motivate this um, tension that there is between theology uh, and science. So what I'm going to present today is a very shortened version of what I came up with. The, the result is, um, is about 32 pages long. I've cut it down to, to less than half of that. So we should um, have a good, um, I should just talk for maybe half hour, 35 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Afterwards, if you're interested in the full version of the paper, just let me know um, afterwards, and I'd be happy to send it um, to send it along to you. So, there's this general cultural assumption in the West that any antagonism between science and theology is inherent in scientific method. So, the great secularizer, it's often thought, is science, because um, the fancy or the sheer unprovability of theological beliefs eventually run smack into scientific fact and we can no longer take the story of the fall seriously, for example, because it's just a story. And so the story goes. Now, for those who are invested in a more fruitful dialogue between science and theology, I think it's helpful to know that secularization is not the inevitable result of science. Uh, and one way of loosening the grip of that story is to show that secularization, including the secularization of science, there's nothing, I think, inherent that says that science has to be secular, has causes that are non-scientific. So Max Weber, for example, thought that capitalism was a great secularizer. Uh, Charles Taylor, Brad Gregory have shown the kind of theological roots of secularization. And um, in this talk, I want to kind of uh, explore uh, along the same lines. So I want to offer a contribution by tracing a political geneal genealogy of secularization through the fate of the fall in the modern period. So I analyze the fading of the fall in early modern political theory. And what I hope to show is that the eclipse of the fall has roots that are political and not scientific. And the naturalization of the fall in early modern political theory contributes to the rise of the modern state and the divorce between theology and political science and between theology and natural science. So I'll start by giving a brief overview of the importance of the fall in, in pre-modern Christian political thought and then examine what happens to the fall in early modern thought. I'll briefly discuss, discuss Machiavelli and Vittoria, but I'll concentrate on the English tradition um, which is most influential in our context, Hobbes, uh, Filmer, and Locke. And I'll show why and how the fall is replaced by the state of nature as a prehistorical justification of political power, and conclude with some comments on the genealogy of the relationships among science, politics, and theology, and um, consider what's lost in all three areas when Western society no longer uses the fall to mark the difference between the way things are and the way things are meant to be. So that's the, th that's the key marker for the fall, the difference between the way things are and the way things are meant to be. So the fall in medieval political theory, the biblical narrative of the fall occupied a foundational place in political theory before the modern period. The fall was seen either as the reason uh, that coercive government was necessary or a significant factor affecting what was possible in human government. The clear consensus among patristic and medieval commentators was that human beings are by nature sociable creatures that are inclined to love their fellows. Augustine, for example, writes that, quote, since every person is a part of the human race and human nature is social, 
Each person also has a great and natural good, the power of friendship, end quote. He goes on to say, however, the human race, quote, the human race is more than any other species at once social by nature and quarrelsome by perversion. <laughs> and it's that distinction then between nature and perversion of that nature that's crucial for Augustine and the Christian tradition as a whole. So in the story of Adam, God teaches us both what we ought to be and what we have come to be because of human choice. So the story of the fall, therefore, is not simply a claim about the evil that lurks in human souls and the necessity of coercive government to make human life possible. The fall is also a lesson about the way humans ought to be and behave the telos of human life, in other words, the goal of human life, based on the way that humans really are, which is the way that they were created by God. So the fall, then, is not a pessimistic doctrine, but on the contrary, gives humans hope that the evil that people do to one another is not natural. That is, it's not simply inscribed in the way things are from creation, and therefore it's not simply inevitable. This, of course, is very different from the way the Babylonians tell the story, right? In the Enuma Elish, the, the Babylonian creation myth, things are messed up from the get-go. There is no fall, right? It's just the way things are. Why are things violent? Because the gods are violent, right? Creation comes out of this primordial battle amongst the gods, and the earth is created out of the body of the slain goddess Tiamat, right? The Hebrews look out at the same world, see it's violent, and, and say, um, why is it this way? Well, it's not because God created it this way. Something happened to mess it up. And what that then does is give you hope that, um, that violence and so on is not simply inevitable. So, though Christian thinkers saw human coercive government as instituted by God, the patristic to high medieval consensus was that coercive government is not natural, but rather a contingent divine response to human sin. So in the city of God, for example, Augustine describes the order of nature in this way. God, quote, did not wish the rational being made in his own image to have dominion over any but irrational creatures, not man over man, but man over beasts. End quote. So the subjection of one person to another came about, Augustine says, because of sin. Quote, and yet by nature, in the condition in which God created man, no man is the slave either of man or of sin. End quote. So nature, it's clear, for Augustine refers to the condition of human beings before the fall and not after. Humans are created in a condition of natural freedom. The fall makes clear that there is nothing natural or foundational about human evil. The fall, furthermore, establishes the possibility of viewing history eschatologically, and that's a crucial point. If the way things appear to be is not the way things are meant to be, then there's hope that things might be changed. Augustine closes this section by looking forward to the day when, quote, all injustice disappears and all human lordship and power is annihilated and God is all in all. End quote. So Augustine may not have expected that to happen anytime soon, but the eschatological view has the effect in the present of destabilizing, destabilizing and relativizing any human claim to political power. It's just the way it is and it's not the way it's meant to be. So Augustine's position then is echoed in the medieval period prior to the, to the recovery of Aristotle. Aquinas departs from Augustine in assigning government to the state of innocence, that is, uh, before the fall. But nevertheless, there's an important, uh, oh, sorry, I missed a, um, yeah, missed a, missed a PowerPoint slide there. Um, there we are, there's Augustine and Aquinas hanging out together. <laughs> so, there's an, so, so uh, Aquinas pushes the origin of human government before the fall, but nevertheless there's an important continuity between the two. Pre-fall government in Aquinas is directive and it's not coercive. And although Aquinas is more sanguine about the capacities of human nature after the fall, for both Augustine and Aquinas, government only becomes coercive because of the fall. So the fall in Christian thought marks this divide between two kinds of nature. Considering our original pre-fall nature is clearly more than an historical exercise, 
It shows us what God's intentions for human life are, and it therefore marks the current disabilities of human nature as not simply inevitable or unfixable. All talk of redeeming a fallen world would otherwise be futile. So when Texans talk about the fact that Texas was once an independent republic, right, it's not just a, a history lesson. It does some real political work in the present by awakening the idea that the subordination of Texans to the federal government is not simply a part of the way things inevitably are, right? I have no stake in this. I am not a Texan. Um, but in similar fashion, consideration of the pre-fall state distinguishes between the way things are and the way things are meant to be. Okay, so then what changes in the, in the modern period? So the eclipse of the idea of a fall of humankind then did not have to await the rise of evolution and the prestige of the natural sciences. That's part of the important point here. This happens much earlier than the, than the eclipse of the fall because of scientific reasons in the, the 19th century. It was eclipsed already in the early modern attempts to create a new naturalistic science of politics, what comes to be called political science. Machiavelli is often considered the first modern European thinker to establish politics on some basis other than theology. He was not only contemptuous of the influence of Christianity on politics, more broadly he sought to establish politics on an empirical basis, that is, on what is rather than on what ought to be. And so the fall is simply absent from Machiavelli's political theory as far as I've been able to discern. The naturalization of politics in the early modern period was promoted not only by skeptics like Machiavelli, but by the Dominican priest Francisco de Vitoria, writing in 16th century Spain, uh, which is a prototype of the modern nation state, Vittoria established political authority not on God's providential grace, but on God's law, expressed in the law of nature, established in the act of creation. <clears throat> so Vittoria rejects the Augustinian idea that the state of innocence was one of freedom from the rule of other men, with the implication that human government was only a later imposition due to sin. He puts it right all the way back to creation. Vittoria considers and rejects the idea that the power of kingship changes after the advent of Christ, and he doesn't even consider the possibility that the fall makes any difference at all. So, rather than study the skeptical and the Thomist uh, traditions in the early modern period, where the fall is just absent, I want to look at, uh, concentrate on the English tradition, Hobbes, Filmer, and Locke, um, both because the English tradition is the most influential in our context and because Adam continued to be significant if an altered presence in these works and so they represent kind of the, the hardest cases for my thesis because Adam doesn't just disappear but he but he mutates into, into something else. So I'll start with Hobbes. Hobbes replaced the biblical story of the fall with the notion of a state of nature. Right, as part of a narrative that justified the existence of political authority. Hobbes', Hobbes attempt to establish a science of politics replaced the dual pre-fall, post-fall schema of human nature with a unitary account of nature. So instead of two natures, now there's one. While use of the state of nature has certain affinities with medieval attempts to justify human government on the basis of human nature, there are significant differences, even where some account of the fall continues to appear. So Hobbes' science of politics depends on an account of nature, most famously in his construction of a state of nature, which being a state of war, necessitates the artifice of the state to make life bearable. The state of nature depends on a conception of what human beings are naturally like when the artificial constructs of human civilization are stripped away and the picture is not pretty, right? He famously says the state of nature is one in which the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, right? Which is a great uh, name for a law firm, right? <laughs> <laughs> poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Um, the state of nature then is not only a state of war, but one in which preemptive war is reasonable given the need to protect one's life and property from the depredations of others 
In the state of nature, the law of nature instills in each human being the desire to seek peace as a means to self-preservation, but the law, being devoid of sanctions, awaits the creation of the coercive political authority to enforce it. It is in our interests to create a state to threaten us all and to keep in our, keeping our covenants. Human nature, however, does not change in the move from the state of nature to the creation of civil government. So human nature is just what it is. So Hobbes, in a, in a sense, is like is much more like the Babylonians. This is just the way it is. There is no fall. Like the state of innocence in medieval political thought, the state of nature serves for Hobbes as a prehistoric condition that justifies civil government, though, of course, his state of nature is the polar opposite of the state of innocence, right? It's a really bad, bad time. The point, however, is not necessarily that Hobbes is pessimistic, whereas um, you know, the Christian tradition is optimistic. The main difference is that for Hobbes, the fall plays no role at all. The state of nature describes neither a pre-lapsarian state of innocence, obviously, nor a post-lapsarian state of fallenness from a former pristine state. There is no looking back to a golden age which thereby serves a normative function. The human being that Hobbes describes in Leviathan is not estranged from his or her true nature, from what he or she ought to be. The state of nature that Hobbes describes as a state of war is what Genesis describes as the consequences of human sin. Humans become aware that they are not what they are meant to be and therefore of their need of redemption. The Christian conscience tells people that they are unrighteous and need redemption. Hobbes's law of nature, on the other hand, tells people they are unsafe and need coercive government to protect their self-interest. So Hobbes's human subjects are dissatisfied with the state of nature, but not with themselves. Now, to put it that way, it might be a little bit unfair to Hobbes. Um, there's a lot of literature now trying to show that Hobbes was in fact a sincere, if unorthodox, Christian, and I'm inclined to, to give that the benefit of the doubt. Um, and he does express concern for the redemption of people from their sins. When Hobbes briefly discusses the sin of Adam in Leviathan, the effect of that sin on posterity is limited to mortality, the loss of eternal life which Christ reverses. But the redemption from the sin of Adam that Jesus works only has a very indirect effect on Hobbes' politics. Hobbes' artificial man, Leviathan, seems to owe a great deal to the theological concept of Adam and Christ as representative persons. Right? So this is an important concept for Hobbes, having a representative person. Just as all sinned through Adam, so all are offered salvation in Christ. The sovereign is the artificial soul of the mortal god, <coughs> Leviathan, a representative person established by covenant. But Hobbes writes, quote, to make covenant with God is impossible, but by mediation of such as God speaketh to. And who does God speaketh to? Well, the, the sovereign, right, the king. Christopher Hill comments, quote, Hobbes' object here is to substitute Leviathan for Jesus Christ. None represents God's person, but God's lieutenant who hath sovereignty under God. End quote. So neither the fall of Adam nor the undoing of the fall by Christ began a new epoch in world history. Neither the first Adam nor the second Adam had any significant effect on the government of the world. One of Hobbes' primary goals, to, so, so salvation is something that happens interior to the person. One of Hobbes' primary goals is to ensure that Christianity could not be used to support sedition against the civil government. And one of the ways he does so is by ensuring that there is no tension between God's rule and human rule, between the way things are and the way things ought to be. The fall is not entirely absent from Hobbes' work, but it serves a very different purpose than it did for medieval thinkers. In his De Chive, Hobbes gives a brief account of the fall narrative in Genesis, concentrating on 3.11, who told thee that thou wert naked? For Hobbes, the significance of 3.11 is the following. As if he had said, How comest thou to judge that nakedness, wherein it seemed good to me to create thee, to be shameful, except thou have arrogated to thyself the knowledge of good and evil? In other words, the whole point of the episode for Hobbes is that 
Adam's sin consists in arrogating to himself the power to judge good and evil, which belongs solely to the king. Right? So the whole point, Hobbes turns the whole point of this episode into obey the king. For Hobbes, coercive government is not made necessary by the fall. It exists regardless of the fall. The king, in fact, stands in the same place that God stands in Genesis, commanding against private judgment. So, so much for Hobbes. Uh, Sir Robert Filmer. Sir Robert Filmer is a not very famous guy who was rescued from obscurity by uh, being attacked by the much more talented John Locke. Right? Um, Robert Filmer is kind of like the Caribbean <coughs> island of Grenada, uh, which we never would have heard of if Ronald Reagan hadn't sent the troops into uh, in 1983. Right? <coughs> Locke's first treatise of government is a lengthy dissection of Filmer's Patriarcha, which is based on his reading of the biblical figure of Adam. So Adam is the star figure here, but rather than build his theory of kingship on an assortment of biblical texts about kings, mainly from the Old Testament, as the previous tradition had done, Filmer attempted to embed his theory of kingship in nature. And Adam serves as this cipher for the natural condition given to human beings in creation. According to Filmer, God gave to Adam at his creation dominion over the woman and the rest of creation. This paternal power, which Filmer simply equates with kingly power, was then transmitted to Adam's posterity and on down the line to kings who ruled in Filmer's time. God gives it to Adam. Adam is the ruler that gets passed down to the present-day kings. Filmer's scheme, of course, only works because of the common Christian assumption that Adam stands as a representative for all humankind. And so the sin of Adam becomes the sin of all. The transmittal of kingly power to Adam's posterity depends on Adam's representative role. However, Filmer departs from the tradition because the fall has little effect on his political theory. Filmer refutes the idea that humans have what Locke calls natural freedom, not by contending that they lost that freedom in the fall, but by contending that all were subject to Adam from the point of Adam's creation. So the fall in Filmer is rebellion against that subjection, but the natural necessity of subjection to Adam and his heirs is the same either pre-fall or post-fall. It's not just that, like Aquinas, Filmer presses the origin of government back to before the fall. The fall really has no effect whatsoever. Locke himself points this out when he criticizes Filmer for contradicting himself. Filmer says, on the one hand, that Adam was monarch as soon as he was created, given absolute power over the whole earth in Genesis 1.28. And on the other hand, he says, in Genesis 3.16, in which the woman is subject, subjected to the man, he says that's the original grant of government. So for Filmer, the discrepancy does not seem to be a contradiction because the fall that intervenes between these two verses doesn't have any effect worth mentioning. And as Locke himself tartly observes, it would be hard to imagine that God in the same breath should make Adam universal monarch over all mankind and a day laborer for his life. Locke could be sarcastic and funny at least it gets going. Now Locke seems here to be rescuing the importance of the fall for political theory, but really he's only getting warmed up in his critique of Filmer. For Locke, the most significant vulnerability of Filmer's theory is the idea of Adam's representation of all humankind. Because Filmer's theory depends on Adam's representative status, Locke attacks that notion, and in so doing severely curtails the importance of the fall for humanity following Adam. <clears throat> in The Reasonableness of Christianity, Locke rejects those who would have all who would have all Adam's posterity doomed to eternal infinite punishment for the transgression of Adam who millions had never heard of, and no one had authorized to transact for him or be his representative. It just doesn't seem fair, right? So the idea that no one can be represented by another without his or her authorization is certainly not just a theological concept, but of course is basic to Locke's political theory. 
His theory of political authority places great emphasis on the natural freedom which includes the liberty of each individual agent to in some way choose or consent to his, own res his or her own res representative. In thus undercutting the mechanism by which God's grant to Adam was passed on to Adam's posterity, Locke undermines the foundation on which Filmer's theory rests. Now, Locke doesn't just throw the whole idea of the fall away. You find references to the fall in a lot of his works, and he in fact wrote these two real brief treatises on the fall. He doesn't reject the fall as such, but he rejects the <coughs> imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity. Locke argues that it's unreasonable to say that someone really can participate with Adam in that sin who did not concur to it by any act of theirs, nor were in being when it was committed. That was a quote. Locke furthermore rejects the idea that God, while not regarding us as having sinned in Adam, nevertheless subjects us to the evils which were due to Adam as punishment for committing the sin. Locke rejects the first option as imputing God's veracity, the second as imputing God's justice. So for Adam and Eve, according to Locke, death was punishment, but for their posterity it's just a consequence of being a corporeal being. Locke's attempts to limit the effects of the fall then are not restricted to his arguments against Filmer. When we look at his positive account of the origins of political authority in his second treatise, we see that Locke's state of nature depends on an eclipse of the importance of the fall for political theory. It just seems to disappear. As in Hobbes, Locke constructs a hypothetical state of nature to justify political authority, but the state of nature is much nicer in Locke than it is in Hobbes. To understand political power or right and derive it from its original, we must consider what a state all men are naturally in, a state of perfect freedom to order their actions, dispose of their possessions as anything fit within the bounds of the law of nature without depending on any other man. The state of nature is also a state of equality, people being promiscuously born to all the same advantages of nature without subordination or subjection, he says unless God explicitly arranged it otherwise. Now whether this condition is pre or post fall is hard to judge because all talk of the fall just vanishes in the second treatise. That, the, that pre fall post fall axis that's so crucial to medieval political theory gives way to pre state of nature, post state of nature as the critical dividing line. I swear I'm getting to why all that matters in, in a little bit. Locke is explicit that both natural reason and scripture affirm that God has given the earth to everybody in common. How then does he explain the fact of private property and inequality, the fact that some are rich and some are, fall, are poor, not by means of a fall. Locke derives the right of private property through labor from God's command to subdue the earth, which comes in Genesis 1.28 pre-fall. But he combines it with God's command to labor and till the earth, which is a post-fall curse given to the man as punishment in Genesis 3.17. And so Locke says, God, when he gave the world in common to all mankind, commanded man also to labor. God, in his reason, commanded him to subdue the earth, improve it for the benefit of life, and thereby lay out something upon it that was his own, his labor. He that, in obedience to this command of God, subdued, tilled, and sowed any part of it, thereby annexed to it something that was his property, which another had no title to, nor could without injury take from him. So Locke combines two passages from Genesis, one from pre-fall and one post-fall, a curse in fact, and he puts them into a seamless argument for what is the natural condition of humankind, so unremitting toil for workers inequality, the enclosure of common lands, which was happening in Locke's time, uh, you know, the appropriation of land from Indians and so on. Uh, that's just the way that God and nature have arranged to make the best use of creation. And Locke, in fact, says that the, the, the reason the Indians of North America have so little is that they haven't improved the land with their labor, right? And so we can take it away from them and give it to the industrious and the hard-working. Right? He was secretary of the Board of Trade and Plantations in the 1670s, and so he's not innocent 
of uh, colonialism. There's a clear political economy behind this getting rid of the fall, in other words. Um, so uh, Karl Marx comments on this and talks about how there's this idea of an original sin, but it's not the biblical idea. It's basically this idea that the reason there's rich and poor today is because once upon a time there were hardworking industrial people, industrious people, and then there were lazy people, and that's why there, we have rich and rich and poor people uh, today. And Marx is basically commenting on this idea from Locke. <clears throat> to say that the traditional doctrine of the fall and original sin has little effect on Locke's political theories, not to say that Locke has no sense of the corruption of human nature. For Locke, corruption is not inherent in human being, though, but it's an effect of social causes. Ian Harris concludes, it seems hard to deny that if human capacities were impaired by the fall, it was to a degree hardly worth mentioning for Locke's purposes." End quote. For Locke, the limits to human capacities are not so much the result of the fall, but rather the natural limits inherent in being embodied creatures created in this middle position between angels and beasts. So for Locke, as for Hobbes and Filmer, political theory based in the fall was replaced by political theory based in nature. Scripture is not completely su superfluous for Locke. It was needed to cover for the weaknesses of human reason. But we see in Locke that scripture has lost much of its load-bearing role and political theory rests on an account of the state of nature and the social contract by which re we remedy the deficiencies of nature, not on any account of life pre or post fall. Okay, so to conclude. Hobbes and Locke are rightly considered founding fathers of modern political theory because their attempts to build a new political science on a no more naturalistic basis. They are considered the first modern rather than the last medieval political theorists because both paved the way for the public authority of the Bible to be supplemented and eventually replaced by nature with a capital N as the secure foundation of knowledge. The eclipse of the fall in early modern political theory then coincides with this new unitary conception of nature. As we've seen, the fall marks a division between two kinds of nature, the way we are and the way we're meant to be. The fall is therefore crucial to an eschatological concept of nature. Nature, in other words, is not simply there, inert, its constant properties to be investigated and codified into constant <coughs> laws. The fall marks the fact that nature has a goal, a telos. There is nature as it is and nature as it will become, the latter of which is revealed by reflection on the original prelapsarian condition in which God has placed us, which in turn reveals God's intention for us. Modern science rejects teleology, believing the nature of matter to include only the way things are and not the way things ought to be. The new science of politics also collapses two natures into one. The way things are is revealed by the state of nature, which politics can ameliorate but not essentially alter. So the fall, in other words, is naturalized, and many of the features of fallenness now simply coincide with creaturehood. It's just the way things are. What I hope to have demonstrated, however, is that there was nothing inevitable or natural about this process of naturalization. The eclipse of the biblical fall story was not simply the putting away of childish stories in favor of hard data. The eclipse of the fall was at least in part political and not scientific. The fall of the fall is part of the secularization of politics, but secularization, as Charles Taylor, Brett Gregory, and others have argued, is neither inevitable nor the simple subtraction of a supernatural worldview from some more basic natural residue. The state of nature upon which Hobbes and Locke built their political theories is based not on empirical testing, but rather on prior political decisions about what kind of government and political economy needs justification. The state of nature replaced the fall with a story of human origins that is no more empirically based and no less susceptible to being labeled mythological than the Genesis story. Claim to know nature and what is natural is for Hobbes and Locke a political move, no less than medieval appeals to scripture. 
which attempts to invest political authority with authority that comes from a non-political source. The story of early modern political theory is a story of secularization, but not in the sense that the term is usually used today. God was not bracketed out. Early modern political states uh, vociferously claimed direct divine authority. But such authority was increasingly unmediated by the church. That's the point. Early modern, political, uh, early modern politics was still very theological. It's just that the church was pushed to the side, and now you have a direct, a direct link from, from the divine to, to the king. Uh, the divine right of kings is an early modern idea, and it's not a medieval idea. The original meaning of the term secularization was the transfer of property or power from ecclesiastical to civil control. In this sense, both Hobbes and Locke contributed to the secularization of politics, which was not yet, if it ever has been, a desacralization. I think in some ways it's just the, the sacred migrates from the church to the state. The eclipse of the biblical fall in particular had significant advantages for the justification of the authority of the modern, nation, modern nascent state, which was busily freeing itself from ecclesiastical interference and appropriating land, judicial powers, rights of appointment to ecclesiastical offices and benefices, and tax powers and revenue from the church. And again, also, besides all of these kind of worldly things, also appropriating God from the church, a kind of direct link to God. The movement of politics from a scriptural to a natural basis meant less reliance on the church for its expertise in biblical interpretation. More importantly, the eclipse of the fall removes the eschatological proviso that the medieval commentators read in the Genesis story. What do I mean by eschatological proviso? That the way things are, we ought to be dissatisfied with the way things are. The fall meant that coercive political authority for Augustine and the tradition that followed him was not natural or permanent, but a temporary remedy for sin until Christ's return, to Christ the true ruler. Political authority, though instituted by God, lived always under the judgment of the way things were meant to be which was, of course, also God's judgment. In contrast, the state that emerges from the state of nature is simply a response to the way things are, and therefore a natural, permanent institution. So in the long run, much of what comes to be called science <coughs> will follow the path that political science followed, divorced from theology and from the church, and tasked with investigating a reduced nature that has been stripped of any eschatological or teleological reference. The fall will be discarded as a quaint myth, and evolution will appear to be guided by purely imminent processes. As I've suggested, however, the divorce of science and theology in the West has been promoted, at least in part, by non-scientific factors. So I've offered this as an examination of the politics of the fall as a contribution to the, politi the political history of science in the West, both natural science and political science. And I'm going to stop there. Okay, we have 25 minutes for questions. I would ask uh, to consideration, please, given the number of people and the amount of time, please limit yourself to one question, and please, questions rather than dissertation. <laughs> Yes, Just a question. Does the, the development of objective science in terms of evolution and um, anthropology and paleoanthropology, etc., accidentally reinforce the political theories that you're describing? Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it, actually. I think that's in part what my argument is, that um, it's not that science produces secularization, it's that um, secularization produces the idea that science and theology can't get along. Um, so the, the, the political movement of secularization in some senses comes before the, um, the, the scientific uh, movement. And so, um, uh, that, so I'm trying to kind of reverse the idea that there's something inevitable about 
um, the idea that science and theology are incompatible. Does that, does that answer your question? Well, what I'm saying is that it, it makes it seem, the scientific developments in terms of the discovery of very hominid forms and violence in, in prehistory and all that kind of stuff, seems to accidentally give truth to what people like Locke were saying, like it was an accidental um, coming together. So a normal person would say, well, of course, the state of nature is nas nas nasty, brutish, and short. Mm -hmm. Based on what we're finding anthropologically when we dig up uh, hominids in the Rift Valley or whatever, it seems like the two of them come together to even to put theology and the fall even more into a mythological category. Yeah, I think that's right, although the, the scientific evidence is really contested yeah, on this. Yeah. And so um, Celia Dean Drummond, who mm -hmm. talked here a few a couple of weeks ago, she was part of this group as well. And she's she teaches science and theology at Notre Dame, and she's got a PhD in botany and a PhD in theology. And she argues that, um, in fact, uh, what the evidence is suggesting now is mm -hmm. that you've got an awful lot of cooperation mm -hmm. in the when when early hominids uh, emerge, and that it's not that this this idea that it's red in tooth and claw yeah. is not the case. I mean, she 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 tries to present this account where um, you have to recognize, of course, that the Genesis account is mythological. It's it's a, a story. And it's not uh, uh, sure. a history lesson or scientific. Um, but she says, nevertheless, there's there are certain truths behind it, and she she makes an attempt to reconcile the the paleontological and the anthropological evidence with the biblical account, insofar as you've got a period of cooperation, which then kind of becomes uh, later on, um, uh, uh, especially when you when you get you know, agricultural societies then later on turns into this this sort of violence. Um, so, um, but I, I, I think I, I think the the main point that you're making though is that there's this is this is an accidental coming yes. together of these two things, and it's not necessary. And I think that's exactly you know, that's exactly where we're arguing as well. Yes, sir. Yeah. If you <coughs> if you divorce uh, science and by extension politics from any vision of this is the way things were meant to be, then I think one of the things you're seeing is that both science and politics become situational. Uh, you see it, I think, in Texas with the rewriting of, of textbooks to reflect the political views of the people there. I think you see it in Nazi Germany with the Science becomes what the politicals of the time wanted to be uh, to reinforce their political goals and so on. Huh. So you're taking something, you're taking away a standard and you're replacing it with what is situational to the goals of whoever happens to be in power at the time. That's an interesting suggestion. So you're suggesting that when, when you say situational, you mean um, once you do away with teleology, um, then you're left with um, just the facts, as they used to say on, uh, who was that, was that right? Drag 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 Hatch, right, just the facts, <laughs> yeah. and the facts are always um, then available to be manipulated by, uh, by the, the, whatever politics is current. Well, like Hitler comes along with one goal, the, the Jews are involved, everything, and so on, and that's my way of power, and so then all the science that the Nazis do is slanted mm -hmm. to reflect that political goal uh, and translate it into the policies of, of the government. Yeah, interesting. That's that's an interesting suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Bill. My question is that the usual assumption that we have about the fall of the fall is that with the uh, optimism of modern society, it was almost inconceivable and hard to imagine ourselves as falling. Right. So that there is a kind of a positive view of man imagined in modernity that eventually actually sits at odds with the story of the fall. Yeah. 
So, but the way that you're describing here does not kind of, do. the fall of the four doesn't render it to either that this was a very negative view of man that needs to be rehabilitated. So where does that positivism emerge within that sort of modernity? How do we begin to look at ourselves as, oh yeah, we're not even capable of the fall, we are such a wonderful, beautiful, Right, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm arguing that at least in its origins, um, in the early modern period, um, it, the, the story is exactly the opposite. I mean, I mean the, the first thing that needs to be, to unpack that myth, the first idea that needs to go is the idea that the fall is a pessimistic doctrine, right? And, and that's what I'm uh, arguing about the medieval period, it's not a pessimistic doctrine, it's not optimistic in any easy sense, but it's a hopeful doctrine, of course, because if you don't have a fall, then we're all in a lot of trouble, right? If that's, if, if the, the way things are is just the way things are, you know, if it's just doggy dog out there and that's all you can say about it, that's the Babylonian kind of uh, point of view, then, then there's no hope that there's any, that there's any kind of escape uh, from this. So the first thing I'm trying to undo is this idea that the medieval, um, conception was pessimistic. It's, it's really not. Um, and then the second thing is showing that, I mean, Hobbes it can never be accused of being an optimist. You know, right? I mean, at, at least, it's worth, you know, Machiavelli, you know, the same way, right? I, I mean, you can, you can make an argument that all, you know, modern political theory comes um, through one of those strands anyway. Um, yeah, that this is not this is not an optimistic idea based on the way things um, uh, on a, a rosy view of human nature, but but rather quite quite the opposite. With Locke, it's a little bit more uh, complicated, and I think um, eventually. But you really have to wait until the Enlightenment, I think, to get um, uh, a full blown kind of optimistic view of the world that dismisses the fall because precisely because it's. Uh, too pessimistic view of the way uh, things are, and how to how to make the connection between the early modern figures and the Enlightenment. I'm not sure how to how I would go about that. I don't know if you can do a genealogy of that, or if that's just. I mean, there's a sense in which, of course, any kind of pessimism very easily flips over into a into an optimism. Um, I mean, there's you know arguments have been made that you know Luther and Pelagius are really on the same page. They're just kind of the two sides of the same coin. Um, so, um, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, my question is uh, more personal to you. Are you bemoaning the eclipse of the fall? Of the fall? Because uh, from your account, the, uh, the narrative of the fall within this uh, political system is no longer being mediated by the church and, um, for instance, perso uh, personified in the uh, medieval commentators on the fall, and then, that, then subsequently the scientific revolution followed the same path. So are you grieving the eclipse of the fall of the fall? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I, I am, and, and for the, um, I mean, you know, obviously not, I, I'm not a kind of biblical literalist, I'm not trying to insist on a historical, you know, scientific reading of the book of Genesis or anything of that nature, um, but what I am um, uh, grieving is the loss of this eschatological idea of politics by which, um, uh, politics is something more than just the art of the possible, right? Um, and that's uh, that's exactly what um, what I'm uh, lamenting, right? I mean, um, it, and there's a million different ways to work that kind of politics out. That the that politics is the art is the art of the possible. Yeah, you can do it in an optimistic way. You can do it in a pessimistic way. But ultimately, you're going to end up in the same place where um, any kind of salvation that we might be subject to is is ruled out um, uh, beforehand uh, and and if we don't have if, if Christ is not king then we're all in a heap of trouble uh, 
in some ways. I mean, that, that sounds very kind of um, the theocratic. <laughs> um, but in one sense, I am a theocrat. I mean, I'm a theocrat in the sense that I think God ought to uh, rule the and does rule the the world. I'm not a theocrat in the idea that the ayatollahs or the priests or the bishops ought to be um, wielding coercive authority. I, I have no idea. I don't want to go back to the medieval era. I don't want to to retain Constantinianism but do want to open up possibilities that God can do something different than what we've, what we've got, I suppose. Yeah. This, so, but I, this sort of goes back to a couple of the earlier questions, but isn't that what, as you move into the Enlightenment, what they're reaching toward is trying to turn nature into, a, into an idealist, idealistic standard, right? So replacing the end goal, like a sort of theologically understood end goal of political society with a natural one. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot set Hobbes is maybe a different story. But for Locke, it doesn't nature does not justify any form of political authority. It justifies a specific form of political authority. Um, so and political authority can be judged as right or wrong or good or bad based on an understanding of, of nature. So isn't are we gradually moving towards go through the Enlightenment, um, not a simple, thinking of a, a naturalistic view of politics that's purely pragmatic, which is what maybe Machiavelli is doing or what Hobbes is doing, but an under, a naturalistic understanding of politics which is precisely idealistic and conceives of right forms of government <coughs> that are judged as right or wrong based not on theological understanding, but on a naturalistic understanding. Yeah, you could. Um... I, I think you certainly can go in that direction, and I guess that's what the founding fathers of the American constitutional order are looking for. Um, and there you still have a kind of at least a deistic idea that God is the author of, of nature. Um, uh, but it's interesting, I mean, so, so you get the equation in the early modern period and into the Enlightenment period, you get the equation of God and nature. And once you get the equation of God and nature, then eventually God becomes superfluous. Um, the problem then becomes when you when you come up with other other ideas of what nature uh, actually is that are unmoored from theological ideas of what nature is. So it becomes possible then um, to see nature in the 19th century is red in tooth and claw, and, and politics is just an, an expression of that. So it, it's all going to depend, of course, on what, 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 your, um, uh, what your reading of nature is. And it can be an optimistic reading of nature, it can be a pessimistic reading of nature, but it's become uh, unmoored. Uh, God becomes the hypothesis that is unnecessary, and, and, uh, and, and a fortiori then the gospel becomes unnecessary. Necessary. Christ becomes uh, unnecessary. Yeah, thank you. This is a wonderful talk. I'm particularly interested in the idea that uh, property rights can be assigned because of labor that people do, that you work the land, that you improve the land. And I'm wondering if uh, the possibility of spoiling the land was something that entered into that thinking, or was that conveniently elated because nothing's ever spoiled permanently, right? That's an interesting uh, comment. Um, this was certainly not on Locke's mind. Um, I mean, when he talks about the wild, open, empty spaces, he uses the term in the, in the, in the second treatise, about the empty, so the, wild, the wide open, empty spaces of North America. I mean, this is really what, what he's thinking of. Um, there's a few Indians around, but really, who cares about them? They're more like the fauna for, for Locke, right? And it's just this huge, um, empty place of resources to be expropriated for, for human wealth. Um, the idea that this might be limited in any sense, I think, is just not on, on Locke's radar at all. But that, of course, I mean, the, the critique you're raising is a critique that's really important to make. Uh, against this kind of, of um, theory of labor um, and wealth, and um, and obviously it needs to be made more and more uh, today. But um, but 
but whether I mean that that that's just not that's not part of what what's on his mind at all. Yeah. Thanks for that. that that's that's interesting. Sir, yes. Could I can I go back to your identification as a theocrat, <laughs> and oh. just and this this is pure spe but how does that? I, I'm personally I would agree you know that if if there isn't uh, a savior if there isn't a god then then what are we left with you know? Um, but in, in a in a representative democracy, right, in the kind of culture and political system we live in, what does that look like? How does that operate? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, gosh. Well, I mean, uh, to be clear, again, it doesn't look like, um, right. you know, the, the bishops are on the Pentagon, right. um, and, you know, or, or anything of the kind. Um, I suppose what it looks like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, it looks like, uh, to me, uh, it, um, efforts on the local level to do something um, like what uh, Dorothy Day and Peter Moore were talking mm -hmm. about, kind of creating a new society in the shell of the old, and um, creating experiments in community which are political in the sense that they are an organization of bodies in space and time um, based on uh, gospel kinds of uh, principles. You know, I'm really um, taken by uh, you know, Sheldon Wolin and these ideas of radical democracy, where um, if you really want democracy, um, you're going to have to make it on the local level. Mm -hmm. And what we have um, it, at the level of the nation state is not um, is not democratic. It's it's a kind of oligarchy where you know the billionaires mm -hmm. uh, rule. And so, um, getting involved in politics uh, means something much richer and deeper um, at a, a, a kind of local level. And that's, mm -hmm. the, I guess, the kind of politics that I would consider to be God's, God's politics, uh, in a way. Thank you. Uh, Other questions? Someone had, had a chance yet? Sir, one, we can go on back to you. I just would, uh, when you were talking about Hobbes, and I was thinking of uh, Lord of the Flies, I wondered if you would say that the Lord of the Flies showed a Hobbesian view of humanity. Yeah, I suppose so. Um, yeah, um, yeah, that's an interesting. Uh, I, I used to have my when I taught high school many years ago, I'd have the students read the Lord of the Flies uh, on the one hand, and then um, a Catcher in the Rye on the other hand, and uh, there you have kind of contrasting. One says we'll just take off the civilization and what you have is uh, is savages underneath and then um, the other one says that we're born innocent and then when we take on civilization that's when we that's when we become corrupted and Hobbes is clearly I think on the, on the former uh, side of that but to me it, his pessimism about human nature is not and his Calvinism is not so much the point um, the point is what happens to uh, the fall in a very kind of unorthodox, uh, kind of un-Calvinist way. He, he you know, simply neglects the fall, and I don't think Calvin would agree that that's just the way, just the way things are. I mean, in this way, Hobbes is very kind of un-Calvinist. Un Thank you. There is a reaction in, in, in the Catholic Church to this uh, to this uh, interpretation of the, the fall during the early modern period. There is uh, because you know I, I'm curious about what what happened in the Catholic Church, which is an important political subject in, in the early modern time, in the way in which the fall is interpreted. Yeah, um, I don't know. Um, is probably the shortest answer to your question. Um, uh, except to say that um, uh, what becomes kind of normative um, Catholic political theory tends to follow Vit Vittoria, um, and you get this kind of Thomism, um, uh, a kind of neo Thomism, which is all based on um, nature and not grace as such. And it's a two-edged sword. I mean, on the one hand, 
you can look at the kind of discourse that goes on in Latin America based on, I mean, where Vittoria is a, is a hero in some ways because you, based on these kind of natural law arguments, you then are able to say that the Indians are human um, and, uh, and, and you get um, the, the kind of things that Las Casas is doing. On the other hand, of course, you also get um, the, this kind of reinforcement of um, a monarchical authority in Spain and all of the kind of baleful effects of that uh, at the same time. So, um, uh, but that's probably as far as, as I could go historically, I, d I just don't know. So, so Victoria, I think, is a very ambiguous uh, figure in this, but, uh, but as far as I know, the fall disappears and nobody protests. Uh, either in the Protestant or the Catholic uh, world. Okay, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Bill.